The Stoa is a digital campfire where we cohere in dialogue about what matters most at the knife's edge of what's happening now. All right, welcome everyone to The Stoa. I'm Peter Lindbergh, the steward of The Stoa. And The Stoa is a place for us to cohere and dialogue about what matters most at the knife's edge of this very moment. And uh, I see a few new uh, faces here. Um, so a little bit about the STOA. Uh, I don't know what we are really, um, a communal podcast, a digital campfire, a wisdom gym, all sorts of things. Essentially we have Zoom events that are um, cool and it's where all the cool good looking kids come to escape uh, culture war noise. Um, so welcome if it's your first time. Uh, you can find more events at the STOA.ca. Uh, uh, and today we have uh, Liam Kavanaugh. Uh, Liam is the head of research at Life Itself. Uh, he organizes initiatives around contemplative activism, uh, and he has a tentative book title from Perspectiva uh, Press called Collective Wisdom, Looking into Western Blind Spots. And today he's going to uh, have a presentation for us, about kind of 45 minutes, on the quality complex, and I'll let Liam explain that and how it works. Usually these are scheduled for an hour, but we might go 50 minutes over that, so it could be 75 minutes. So the first uh, 45 minutes, Liam's going to present. Then uh, we're going to uh, have Q&A, how that works. Drop your question in the chat box. I'll call on you, unmute yourself, ask it to Liam. If you don't want to, uh, don't want to be on YouTube, because this will be on YouTube, indicate that and I will read it on your behalf. So that being said, I will allow Liam to unmute himself and take him in. Welcome to the stall, my friend. You got to unmute yourself. Hi, hi everybody. Uh, so can I, I can share my screen now, Peter, as well, is that right? Okay, and you should still be able to see me as well. Okay, so thanks everybody for showing up. I've also called it uh, questioning equality, uh, the presentation. So before I, I'll say a little bit about what life itself is up to, but before I get into that, um, I, I just start with a spoiler alert. Uh, e equality is not wrong, that's not the point of the the, the presentation, but it is an ideal. And the best way to live up to ideals is never to turn them into dogma. Um, and I think uh, we've lost sight of that a little bit with equality, and that's really the main uh, point of the presentation today, or something I would question, you know, invite people to inquire into, to, you know, to what extent we sort of um, turned equality into a dogma that may be counterproductive at points. Um, I think we all have some sense of that, but I'd like to go into it a little bit more fully than is normally done. Okay, so about me, Peter already uh, spoke about it a little bit. I'd just like to say for this particular background, uh, uh, for this particular presentation, that I um, spent a lot of time at Plum Village uh, Monastery where uh, a lot of the ideas um, or the, the, the background for this come from. Uh, the opinions are my own, but I will draw on that tradition. Uh, and also I did a PhD in cognitive science at UCSD, embodied cognition was the specialization. Uh, and so I was well aware that emotions and thoughts are, are highly connected, okay. Uh, and then I think it's useful to talk about life itself. Um, life itself, we're it really a community for a wiser world, uh, pragmatic utopian, so which means that we really are interested in these like infrastructure for awakening practical questions like spaces for a new culture, actual living spaces for people. If you're going to think and be differently, um, sort of questioning things like our addiction to rationality, our addi addictions to individualism, to equality at a deep level, like actually not intellectually saying that you think those things might be problematic, but really trying to see um, see completely uh, or more completely uh, how those might be ideologies that have um, become unuseful at, at points then it's good to be surrounded by other people who are uh, doing the same thing and that's uh, part of what we're trying to do which is very relevant to this presentation uh, and we take that as to be part of 
creating, you know, well, setting up a, a sort of a, the conditions for the formation of a new culture and envisioning the future. Okay. Okay. So, you know, to start off, I'd just like to say, you know, and give an homage here that, that ideals of equality have done a lot for us. Uh, I wouldn't like to say otherwise. Uh, all of us owe at some point the rights that we have to social movements that use uh, equality as, as a rallying cry. Um, that meaning that uh, most of our, our, our ancestors were serfs or peasants or were enslaved in some way. And so, and, and, and they used equality as part of, part of the argument for uh, why they should be treated differently. And so there's a good reason why we're attached to it. Um, but um, attachments are a source of suffering. Uh, and, and if you get, if ideas become more than ideas, uh, become reality, then, then they can be distorting. And I really started thinking about this uh, during a meal time at Plum Village, which is uh, Thich Nhat Hanh's, as I mentioned, Zen monastery. And often before a meal, we renew our aspiration to be free of the inferiority complex, the superiority complex, and the equality complex. Okay. And so, that took me on a trip down memory lane. Um, I thought of, oh, I, I kind of know what they're talking about here. This idea that we can all do anything we want, which my mother, who was a school teacher, would complain bitterly about, right? That sort of she was obligated to tell uh, everybody, uh, all of her, her school children, that uh, they were able to do anything that they wanted to do, uh, despite the fact that she didn't believe it herself. And then she'd have sort of uh, kids who were not very athletically gifted or very tall who thought they were going to be professional basketball players and therefore felt they didn't study or I also thought of times and, and university when a class would erupt into arguments because a, a teacher was so bold as to suggest that there were differences in, on average in height and strength between male, male and female populations and that caused a devaluation of women in feudal warrior cultures. This was taken as an example of or evidence of his sexism by some students who got very angry and the class was derailed. Of course, I knew at that time just from uh, psychology classes, which was one of my majors, that testosterone is basically a performance enhancing drug, if you call it steroids, make it synthetically. Um, and, and so, you know, that sort of flies in the face of basically of of experience of Olympic and you know professional sports, uh, and that of course you know high levels of testosterone do increase strength, and and men worldwide have higher heights than women. Um, you know, and which goes with another thing: if you can't generalize, right? There's this injunction that comes up at times that you can't generalize. Uh, of course, all words are generalizations. So it's in cognitive science, you learn that essentially. It's what all words are. The word French doesn't mean anything if there's not some way in which French people are different from Germans next door or any other nation, right? Chair is a generalization, car is a generalization. You're generalizing about classes of objects. As one of my first uh, spiritual teachers, Chris Judy Krishnamurti said, um, as a rule, you can generalize. And at the same time, any and that basically reason works. Like concepts seem to work relatively well, and the only conditions under which they would work well is we can, that there's something to generalize about. Uh, and this is juxtaposed against the Iraq War when it was so clear that we, that in my country, we were not valuing the lives of Iraqis like we were valuing our own lives, right? Like casualties um, in the Iraq war were reported you know, very vociferously if they were American casualties and there was a good reason to get out of the war. Um, but but um, casualties, uh, you know, Iraqi civilian casualties were very lightly reported on. It's almost like a, felt like an afterthought. And so this was um, you know, puzzling to me to say the least. Um, and I understood this equality, you know, complex idea. So uh, back to Plum Village, we understand the inferiority complex and the superiority complex. 
Um, what about the equality complex? Uh, you know, what does that what does that really mean? Um, well, I mean, equality you can say implies comparison, separation. You take the on just puts it this way. It's like, oh, I'm, you know, superiority, I'm superior, or inferiority, I'm inferior. Equality, oh, I'm exactly equal, and I'm really looking closely at those fingers to make sure that they're equal. It's about a, a, a state of comparison, right? So you're not really in a relationship. You're comparing yourself with the other, very definitely experiencing yourself as separate from the other. Um, not part of a, a group, right? When you really experience yourself as, say, part of a team in a sport, you really notice this, that a uh, sense of self uh, separate from others tends to dissolve. Um, and a lot of uh, reciprocity and, and pro-social behavior in humans, uh, as we, you know, I'd say in, in, when you study the mirror system, et cetera, right, uh, seems to depend on these intersubjective states, uh, and it's not, it's not clear to most people phenomenologically that you're in those when you're thinking about equality. Um, okay, so actually I might just go through the next slides before opening up the questions. Um, just to, you know, expand on that further through the lens of, of Buddhist philosophy, like equality on one hand versus loving kindness. So sort of uh, broad, love of the other, um, agape in Latin. Um, what, what's the difference? Um, well, I mean, when you, those, they may give you uh, quite similar results in a way if you treat other people as equals or operate according to moral rules of equality, uh, but it isn't the same process underneath it. And th that's only sometimes you might see uh, some conversion or convergence rather. Um, in a way, another way of saying it is that the kind of truth that words can have, relative truth, is equality or something that equality kind of touches on. And the truth the world has, ultimate truth, is, is a distinction that comes up in uh, spiritual thought. So it's just like Words are about what is, actuality just is, the suffering of others just is, their inherent um, consciousness, you know, the fact that they are a conscious being with suffering, with a heartbeat, with experience of life, the ability to see sunsets that just kind of is. You can deny it, uh, you can find a way to be unaware of it, but it's, it's just out there. And then when we start talking about equality, we're talking about that experience, we're in, in about this colloquially in the head versus being embodied. Uh, and so this is, you know, a, a major distinction perhaps. Um, you know, and the parallel it gives people to kind of feel through this is feeling into a relationship, say with the significant other, and this more gets into freedom and individuality versus thinking about preserving your freedom. If you can have, you know, a, a loving relationship with another person, and then sometimes you start thinking about your freedom, like, oh, I seem to have lost my freedom. So I remember back when I was in, in a relationship and I kind of missed being able to do what I want. Now, in that, in that point, you kind of tend to be comparing not yourself to the other person, but yourself against your past self. And I think you might experience a movement back from being in a relationship, like being there in the relationship in a kind of a lived relationship, but really in an intellectual space, thinking about the relationship, right? So when you start thinking through that lens of freedom versus being in a relationship, there's a change. And you may take what you notice about your, with your ideas of freedom and, and bring them back to the relationship and sort of see if there's something you can do differently with this living person so that uh, what you valued about your single life is, is relived, brought back into living. And that, that's great. You know, it's not to say that uh, everything intellectual is, 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 uh, is not valuable. It can be quite valuable. It's just, it's not the same as, as being there. Um, so, you know, again, if you're, so you're saying that talk about equality is misguided. No, no, I'm, I'm saying that it's an idea. 
and that really matters. And it's an idea that we sometimes forget as an idea, which can be called dogma. And um, yeah, that's, that's a, a start. So maybe, Peter, is it all right if we just see if there's any major questions just as far as understanding at this point? Sure. Um, feel free to put your questions in the chat any time, by the way. Uh, do you want people just to unmute themselves uh, or put up their hand? Uh, yeah, if, especially if we have an just question about like understanding, like if they just basically don't know what I'm saying. If you can have a question about, you know, you know what, what about letting go of equality and that kind of things, because I'm not, I'm not saying that. So, if, but if you don't understand something half says at this point, it'd be useful to know. Cool. So uh, feel free to maybe raise your hand or put a question or you just have a question in the chat and we'll call on you. Maybe not. Do we have any? I don't see any hands. Yeah, seems good so far. Okay, great. Then, then I'll, I'll just continue then. Okay, so showing that equality can be dogma, right? This is a good exercise for that. Equality can become dogma. Blank is good, but being obsessed with blank is not so good. Right, okay. So let's fill in the blank with something good. For example, sex. Sex is good, but being obsessed with sex is not good, so good. Most people would agree with that. Um, freedom is good, but being obsessed with freedom is not so good. It's kind of the point I just got to if you're obsessed with freedom. Most people would agree, yeah, there's a way of, of doing that, where it's a bit like, um, it, doesn't, it doesn't give space to be in a relationship. Being clever um, is good, but being obsessed with being clever is not so good. Also, most people would agree with, despite the emphasis we put on intelligence, healthiness, I think most people agree with. But my experience is that if you put equality in the, that blank, then suddenly, um, that it gets people to be reactive, um, right? Which is interesting because it's a sort of a, a paraphrase of another quote by Thich Nhat Hanh, which is that equality is not a source of suffering, but the equality complex is. Um, right, and what might he mean by that? I mean, one way of saying it is that well, it'd be great to look around the world and see more signs of equality, more income equality, more equality of influence around the world. Uh, that would be wonderful if we saw that a year from now, but is obsession with equality getting us there? Also, uh, that being obsessed with equality is a source of suffering because equality oftentimes is very, very difficult to obtain, which I'll go into in a bit. Okay. Okay. And so I'll get into this, the, the, the forthcoming book on collective wisdom. It's just like, the, at this point, it's good to say how I got here a little bit. Like, what is my interest in this? It's really, I looked around the world, and I said, wow, we're really in a, in a bit of a fix, like a lot of people. I believe we're in a civilizational crisis. Uh, and as a Buddhist, or some as cognitive scientist who's been very impressed with Buddhism, I would say, you know, at some point, I don't know where one begins and the other ends. I think of attachments as the source of all suffering, right? And the deeper the attachment, the more the suffering. And I'd say the enlightenment, in this case, I'm not talking about the Buddhist enlightenment, but the European enlightenment does not seem to have stopped our suffering. In fact, the world really, to me, seems to be in crisis. So if you want to understand our suffering, we might want to look at our deepest attachments for an answer, habits of thought. And if you look at the Enlightenment, that's a very confident word, right, to call a period of our history the Enlightenment. So it's a good place to look for some misplaced assumption, perhaps. We found one, rationality, uh, individualism, and then equality, right? And so going back to method that I was employing before, 
We can look at rational explanation as good, but being obsessed with rational explanation is not so good, right? That's rationality. And people would agree with that. In fact, that obsession traps us in a system of oversimplified generalizations and arises along with an addiction to certainty and control. Postmodernism largely describes an era of dawning experientially driven realization of this fact, right? That we're realizing that, okay, rational explanations are the center is not holding. Individual freedom is good, but being obsessed with individual freedom is not so good. In fact, it traps us in an ability to be fundamentally, inability to be fundamentally part of a group. Uh, loneliness, libertarian politics with an aversion to, to acknowledging collective action and the need for it. Um, lots of broken marriages and families follow. Um, um, you know, but if we go with equality, my experience is many people see this, uh, there's much more uh, of a response for that's just fine, or it's even sort of a duty. And the point being that this is kind of one of these, these of, of liberty and equality and rationality, um, we don't really get very uh, skeptical of. And so I'd just like to, um, for here, for a moment, leave you to contemplate uh, the beginning of the chapter 30 of the Book of Tao, which begins, the highest virtue is not virtuous, therefore it has virtue. The lowest virtue holds on to virtue, therefore it has no virtue. As highest virtue does nothing, yet nothing needs to be done. The lowest virtue does everything, yet much remains to be done. How does that feel for you um, when we look at the current discussion of equality? So to me, that verse um, is really gesturing towards, and, and the rest of that, actually, the whole verse, is gesturing towards this beginning of insight and the movement towards empty ceremony and sort of covering life with rules. Um, and when we look at equality and what we mean by it, I would contend that we see a classic example of that. One sense of equality is we're equal in the eyes of God. All lives are equally sacred and worthy of respect. This is really easy to agree with, really hard to actually live up to. It's, it's again, akin to Christ-like love we're seeing with Buddha nature, sort of the um, total objects of, of our most revered spiritual traditions, which few people are uh, held to really totally approach, but that we can all aspire to and to some degree touch. Um, many people who see the world this way treat each other as, as equal without pressure. Okay. okay, equality in another sense, they're equally valuable in the ordinary sense of value, so we should have equal outcomes. And fewer people would agree with this explicitly, um, but there's this kind of tendency towards it, which, um, sort of starts to come out in this quote here. I don't know why I'm getting so much feedback. Sorry about that. Uh, Martin Luther King, this is from a sermon uh, on the American dream. It's on a famous one, uh, but he gets into this a little bit. He says, we're challenged more than ever to respect the dignity and the worth of all human personality. We're challenged to really believe that all men are created equal and don't misunderstand that does not mean that all men are created equal in terms of native endowment, in terms of intellectual capacity. It doesn't mean that. There are certain bright stars in the human firmament in every field. There are individuals who do excel and rise to the heights of genius in their areas and in their fields. What it does mean is that all men are equal in intrinsic worth. 
Okay, and so value and worth, like, what is that? What is, what is, what is he talking about? And then what do, is more commonly meant? Um, okay, I mean, so God, Christ, and Buddha, you know, depending on if you believe in any of those, may see the pure value of life itself in men. Um, eyes of men are frequently more profane. Uh, we, we tend to see worth oftentimes in, in what a person does for us, right? We construct their value or their status. We take the many facets, and this is sort of something that cognitive scientists would agree on. You take this many facets of a person, you boil them down to a particular quantity, which is basically like the worth most of the time, the worth that we see in a person. So we look at them, they have all this complexity, and it's sort of like, well, overall, how good do they make me feel? Which you might say is sort of a simulation of how talented they are, how much money they have, how eloquent they are, what's the, the social halo uh, having to do with them, right? Which is what I'm talking about here is basically group status and social status. Right? And this makes, helps us make choices a lot, like a price. When we took, look at an object, we place it on basically a line, you know, a one-dimensional line of, of quantity, and, and you make a choice of what's worth more than the other. It helps you make choice of who, who, who to befriend, who to help, so on and so forth. That's, you know, the world that we live in, basically. And, and that tends to be what we start to mean by work. Okay, and so then in normal, uh, normal life, so how might expression of each other's sacredness express itself? Well, we see these, this kind of equality that, that King is talking about and that spiritual traditions generally are talking about. We see more equal net incomes, equal freedoms, equal respect in interpersonal relationships, openness to the opinions of all people. You know, we would see those things. We see quite a lot of it. Maybe not totally equal, of course, but more equal than right now. Like, let's not pretend that the inequality of incomes that we see is mainly due to talent in the world, right? That's, that's clearly not the case. You know, we look at humanity as a whole or freedoms or any of the rest of those things. Um, And how might appreciate what others can do for us express itself? Well, we see each other's in terms of value to us. We get lots of inequality, clannishness, status worship, exclusivity in interpersonal relationships, disinterested in the opinions of most people. You know, what relevance is that to my life, your opinion? Does it matter? Can I do anything about that problem? Uh, you know, do I need to talk to you? What can you do for me? Uh, status, you know, we, we, we want to know people who can, who can shed a good light on us and et cetera, right? Okay. And so the question then is sort of what do we really believe in? Which of these perspectives might occur to us? And that itself is part of this quest for certainty. I think it's worth pointing out here that, that one, another way we'll, we'll go back to Buddhist philosophy is that we don't, really believe in you know the real self in the same way or don't hold that idea in the same way um the inherent as to say that this inherent worth that king is talking about which might be called buddha nature christ-like love the ability to just directly see this sacredness of people is there but so is the ego right alongside of it you know and as soon as you see the value of people then you have your ego sitting on your, your back saying oh you're so enlightened, you know, wow, you know, really, you know, you're, you're amazing. You've really progressed. And then you're, then you're above everyone. Right. And those things are just side by side. You know, they say uh, yesterday's insight is today's ego trip. Those are, are just two parts of the, well, that's the human condition, you know, to have these, these two perspectives side by side. Uh, is one true or the other? One might be deeper than the other, as I kind of gestured towards before, more closely connected to actuality or more primary, that if you're just looking uh, directly at people, you may notice uh, without any ideas or, or um, 
yeah, any, any conceptual uh, structure, many people, I'll say in spiritual traditions, report that as their conceptual activity dies down, they're really overwhelmed with love for other people. They feel highly connected. Um, so there might be something more basic about um, this uh, feeling of, you know, connection and understanding of sacredness, but it's not uh, more real, really. Um, okay, and so getting into the realities of ego and power, having an ego means that you don't want to be equal, but better. And having power means that you don't have to be equal if you don't want to be. So as long as there's power and selfishness, there's not gonna be equality, right? And, and the, the history of racism and institutional authoring says this. Uh, the deepest forms of racism have often said, right? Acknowledging the kind of value that King's talking about. I see that these are people with souls, but they're not equal in abilities. Uh, they're unable to govern themselves and they can't achieve what I can or what my group can, right? This is the classic racist line. So though I see that they're equally sacred, they should not have equal rights or equal outcomes. So there's this claim that I see the value of people, but none of the things that we all really suspect should come from a mindset that is truly connected to that value follow from you know, the racist ideology. And then we have this sort of dishonest weaving of these claims into a law, um, and this is why, you know, the, 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 it's said that only powerful and dominant groups can be racist, right? Um, because they, they have to take some ability, power basically to enforce that type of thing. And so going to ideals and inequality and equality rather, or inequality, few well-off people have shown much interest in total equality. Um, climate change can make that more obvious. Right when when we start to have flooding and um, God forbid, but very likely, uh, you know, Bangladesh starts to to flood massively, and we have tens of millions of migrants. Um, you know, the commitment to equality is going to be put to the test, right? And then that's the real question for the future: if we're going to you know con continue to be in the equality complex, is it going to hold up? You know, like in that situation, we say to ourselves, ah, oh, these equalities, these ideas, they're just BS. You know, are they? You know, well, I'd say it's equality is, is not BS, but the idea that believing in equality is enough to treat each other as equals is BS, right? So what do you do when divine and profane natures are in conflict? One answer would be to cultivate divine nature. That's the answer of, of, of spiritual traditions. It's no longer something that we talk about in the West post the secular age. Um, basically, after, after we decided that we were going to be secular rationalist, rationalist culture, that is not an answer to public policy uh, problems. Uh, and so that's something, something we talk about more. Another one is make rules, right? When divine and profane natures are in conflict, let's make some rules keep people in line. And to make those rules, you need some clear criteria and you get these you know, observable metrics to measure equality. So equal pay, horizontality of organizations, equal employment by gender in all industries, equal speaking times, no generalization about differences between groups. And not to say, it's not that all of these are, are wrong. Some of them are quite, work very well as heuristics, right? So again, you know, don't confuse saying, oh, okay, this is how you enforce, because we, if we give up on cultivating true understanding of value, then, then we tend to go on these things. It doesn't mean that they're ineffective or that they couldn't, they, they, they aren't useful as, as, a, as a, an intellectual moral idea. Intellectual moral ideas are useful, uh, as I gestured to before about the, the side about looking at your, your ideals of freedom within a relationship, they can be used, but if they're exclusively without a connection to anything else, then, then a, a bit of a problem, I'd say. And you know, some of these things are, um, you know, we can look, equal employment gen and genders in all industries is what Jordan Peterson, 
one of the, the things that made George, Jordan Peterson famous for arguing against that by claiming that essentially um, women as, as a population show little interest in some professions, especially ones that require a lot of social isolation and so forth. And the real you know, difficulty is not even that these are true or untrue, but that we can't discuss them without sort of fights breaking out. You know, I wouldn't, I, don't, I would say in many of these things, I have no idea whether they're true or not because the political conversation gets so uh, heated so quickly that uh, do, we, do I actually believe I'm hearing all the best perspectives on them? You know, I doubt it. Um, okay. And so this is, I would ask you to consider, right? Are we recapitulating a common problem? where we, re we have measures that replace or interfere with valued states themselves. Like think of test scores in schools. Like obviously, if you have children who are learning mathematics or history very well, and then you give them a test, like they are doing the kind of learning you really want children to have. And you give them a test, the kids that are doing learning very well, the kind of learning you really want will show good test scores. But if you then obsess with the test scores, that is oftentimes seen to interfere uh, deeply with the learning that you'd like to see. Publications and citations in academia are very similar, right? That a, you know, a dynamic scholar is going to produce a lot of books that get cited by people. However, the academia that we have measures people according to that. And what we get is publications that are sort of you know, blown up, people giving sexy stories, so that they get cited more, so that they get their metrics, and then they don't replicate. You know, it's no surprise at all if you've been inside science that eighty percent of studies don't replicate in some fields. You know, you could look at bench presses and depth of yoga poses as well. I mean, again, those are indicators of health. If you're exercising well, and and your bench press would increase, and, and if you're doing yoga well, then your poses will get deeper. But um, making them the measure of all things is counterproductive, right? Okay. So here, just pause to give people a chance to just internalize that, take uh, a couple breaths before I just go for the last few slides. We're almost there. Okay. So this last bit, I'll just get into a sort of timbre of, of, of public debate and um, moral superiority. So we're taught to stand for equality, to distinguish all our, our, our ways, ourself and all ways, including morally, right? So we're taught to be equal, but not to be average. Um, and then there's a way of putting yourself above other people for standing, by standing for equality um, more than they do, which creates a very strong contradiction in uh, our moral life, which I think has increasingly perverse consequences. Um, so standing for equality is a way of distinguishing oneself morally as I said, love is difficult to prove, but things like equality and outcomes are, they're a metric. Hmm. You know, something we can point to, it's very clear, okay. I stand for equal outcomes, like everybody in, on earth, when we figure out global warming, it's gonna be an equal, just outcome for everybody. Um, I'm pushing for equality of outcomes. Uh, and against racism, the way of being moral or performing morality. You can, it can be both, you know, it can, it can obviously be, be both. Um, and the question is, how is it being done, right? Um, and so, I mean, just thinking of this, going back to you can't generalize. How is that statement oftentimes said? It's not really said like, uh, well, I don't, I don't know, you can generalize. It's often it's more like, you can't generalize, right? 
and the tone of conversation within a relationship is the biggest predictor of whether it's going to fail. This is what relationship psychology has said for decades, right? Um, it's, it's the way that uh, things are said. So if you're being morally superior because you are pushing for equality, but and you're, you're, you are, it's sort of obvious that your end purpose is moral superiority, then, then I don't think it's very effective at all, right? Um, okay. I think I'd like to talk about this generalization um, a bit. Okay, very briefly, like what do we really mean there? What we kind of mean is, um, or what, it, what is meant is, this is said only in certain contexts where there is a generalization about a group that has been discriminated against in the past. And the idea is, I think, that if we allow the door to any generalization whatsoever about a group that's been discriminated in the past, then we're opening the door to generalization generally, and that can be used to justify racism in the way that generalizations have been used to, just, to, to justify discrimination in the past. So essentially it's a taboo on generalization, um, which is supposed to prevent discrimination, right? And so it's kind of, a, it's a, and it's an easy metric. Well, you have to generalize in order to be a racist. Just because you do generalize doesn't make you a racist, right? You might also be interested in understanding the experience of, of people who are different than you, right? Like if you actually spend time in, in Africa, which I did for three years, I mean, Africans will end endlessly generalize about how they're different from Europeans. They're, they're very happy to talk about it. They notice that there's huge, huge differences. Uh, and, and, and it's not, a, you know, an offensive thing at all. You know, there, are, there can be offensive generalizations, uh, but, but uh, the act of generalizing general, in general is not offensive in particular. It can be. And so this, this kind of attempt to ban all generalization uh, in spots is, is kind of like, it's a certain, there's, it's quite, we're saying basically it's a bit dishonest because we're not actually saying what's, what we really mean because of course you can generalize. But we're kind of saying you can't generalize about that because I don't trust you or you cannot be trusted, right, to generalize, which is something that's been going on in, you know, uh, sort of left-wing conversations for a while. And it's a sort of, you know, cultural um, superiority trump card. Uh, and, you know, it hasn't been doing us, I think, any favors, right? And so that's a sort of way in which anything kind of goes when we feel like we're standing for equality, which is a sign of a dogma, right? To go back to the main point. Okay, so we'd be better than going through that, you know, rather than going through that kind of thing of accepting moral shortcomings. And I mean involving the same kind of acceptance that starts off with effective engagement of all sorts of habits, like drinking too much, lying or shoplifting that don't serve us. Saying like, yeah, I am this way, you know, if people are racist, they would be better off them being able to be racist to say like, okay, I'm, I have aversive conditioning, uh, you know, and say, yeah, they, they think these things uh, and they admit that these, they think these things and maybe they need some help or they can at least work on them. As it is right now, I think, you know, a large percentage of people, uh, white people have, you know, I mean, and, and, Tests of implicit association show this dramatically. You know, I believe that stuff very much. I think that the majority of the white population has, uh, you know, conditioned aversion to people of color and, and black people, especially. And it, it isn't obviously not doing us any good to just deny it. Um, 
acceptance allows us to look at any habit's roots and effects. This is what we do to break any, any habit that's destructive. Uh, egolessness is rare and compassion for ourselves is what's necessary. Um, I think also, um, and when we get into climate change realism, it's the same thing, but claiming to live up to our ideals of equality, those of us feel, we feel the reckon must, West must reckon with its, its historical legacies of colonialism, racism, and violence are easily dismissed as hypocrite. And now is not the time to let that happen. We do better by embracing both high ideals and compassion for both ourselves and others, as many ancient wisdom traditions advocate. Again, I say here, we've basically lost something with the Enlightenment, right? And we get into certain perversities, uh, counterproductive political engagement, which I've discussed, even loss of sacredness of the lives of violators of equality of norms, like Django Unchained, right? It's basically okay for everybody to celebrate the brutal deaths of racists. Right, and, 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 and if you talk to you know, left-wing people uh, you know, among, among those crowds, you see quite a lot of like, yeah, that's, you know, I, I'm quite happy um, for, to sort of, you know, essentially wish death on, on racists. I mean, where you see that norms of equality heavily held have essentially interfered with what's good about, you know, with the really deep core, right, which is this, this inherent value of all lives. And we're holding the, the surface structure so heavily that at points we lose sight of the sacredness of lives. Like that should tell you, you know, where we're at with it. Somewhere very dark, right? And so what to do? Uh, be aware, be compassionate, don't be afraid. I think there are more people that agree with you than you think. And awareness of rationality, individuality as an ideal or ideologies has become a transformation of culture. I think the same is probably true here if we actually start doing it. Um, and just practice holding ideas differently. Every you know, conversation about these things is a chance to hold the ideas differently and, and non-reactively. So I think that's all I have now. Sorry if it was a bit long. All right, so... Um... Thank you, Liam. If you have any questions, feel free to start throwing them in the chats. Just indicate question before your question. And um, so we're here for about 25 more minutes. I'll start off with uh, a few questions. Um, so one of the kind of the essence here at the STOA is to hold uh, complexity. Uh, we have a lot of like, kind of different speakers from what I would call the different mimetic tribes come in and they talk. And then we ask them basically like loving questions, tough questions, but in a loving way. And we have a wisdom gym here and we do all these kind of intersubjective practices like circling, restorative circles, empathy circles, stuff like that. Do you think those practices, those intersubjective practices where you like immediately get a visceral sense of the status dynamics, the power dynamics in an interaction and you can call it out, the modality allows for that. Do you think those are a source of um, to practice this to get greater awareness of it. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I guess I don't even feel the need to elaborate on it. Um, people should come to those and try them out. I, I mean to, I've been meeting Peter to come and join you for some of those. They look amazing, but yeah, we do things like that uh, ourselves. Um, it's, it's exactly that, um, getting, you know, in sort of embodied contact with people and Working through these things is the way to go. Um, and if people see that you've developed some solidity um, with it, then they can start to take you seriously when you talk about it. Cool. Um, do you mind if I unshare your screen now so we can kind of sure. get a yeah, uh, stop the recording? Sure. Okay, so Dan Feldman had a question and you touched on it already, but I'll, I'll read it. Uh, he wanted me to read it on his behalf just to see if it jogs anything for you. So. How can your framing guide us in addressing the cancel culture moral pandemic that is getting progressive academics canceled, JK Rowling attacked, climate documentaries, Michael Moore censored, um, et cetera. The culture left appears to have assumed the tactics of right-wing cancel movement, uh, e.g. McCarthyism. Um, yeah, that's his question. Well, could I, I'm sorry, I, I didn't, could you repeat it again? Because I didn't, I didn't get what the, what the question was exactly. Uh, how can your framing guide us addressing the, I guess, the cancel oh, culture? Oh, guide us. Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, I mean, I would say if you, 
So you have to look deeply into all those questions, but essentially the basis of the moral stance there is that people are standing for equality as kind of, of human beings is, is the basis of a lot of that, that somehow they feel that um, people are, I mean, it's an oftentimes quite associative um, level that people are challenging, you know, that there's challenges to equality. Uh, and that's a lot of, of the cancel culture movement. And it's really this thing of dogma, right? If you look into believing completely in equality as an ideology rather than a useful guide, you know, it's, it, for me, it's like a useful heuristic, right? Uh, and, and that's not dealing with heuristics, right? It's like, okay, well, we should, you know, for example, um, you know, we, we, we should, it's, it's a good thing to put your, your, you know, your pronouns next to your name, you know, it's, it's, a, it's, a, you know, it's not held lightly in a lot of spaces, right? It's kind of like, no, you should do it. And, and, and you know, if, if it was just like, I think this is more civilized, if, you know, that's their people's opinion that it's a more civilized um, practice, then, you know, it would, um, it would register one way. Uh, the way sometimes I've, I've seen it held, and it's not always, because there's many people who hold it quite like, I would say gracefully, but there's some other times where it gets held in more of a dogmatic way, like, you know, it's an affront to equality everywhere because you're saying, you know, that you don't need the pronouns, and other people need the pronouns. Um, and it can get, you know, a bit mm, aggressive, I suppose I'd say. Does that help or does that make any sense? Dan, uh, do you want to unmute yourself and have any follow-up? Uh, yeah, um, I, I guess my my follow-up would be, do you, oh, I'm sorry, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. uh, I guess my follow-up would be, uh, do you think that we are getting into this dogmatic uh, view of equality because we're facing, you know, a century long or two century long situation, you know, a situation of economic uh, inequality that is, you know, almost like uh, ancient Egypt or something mm -hmm. that's happening in some, like in the US, for example. And the left has stopped struggling for economic justice. And so, for some reason, there's been this ideology that's spreading that the only thing we can fight over are these cultural um, identities. And so people are kind of, the, the serfs are at each other's throats while the, uh, you know, the elites, the power elites and the capitalists are kind of, you know, sitting back and enjoying this because they're not, there's no struggle to, um, there's no challenge to the 1% essentially. Mm. Um, yeah, I would definitely say there's an element of that. I think, yeah, you know, one way of saying this is kind of, okay, you know, how much do these ideologies do for us? And, okay, when we look at historically the movements that have been successful in getting more equality up until now, um, where it's really been costly to make a concession most of them had sort of a political power of some type. You know, women are half the population. Um, African Americans, you know, 15% of the population, but that's more than enough to, you know, make political noise, you know. It's, they, they, they were very much, they may have been a minority, but very much like capable of exerting political pressure um, if we feel that essentially we can't mount uh, the political pressure um, because of left, the left is too divided or, or, or it can't get itself together, then, then yeah, there's kind of like, there can be a tendency, I suppose, to go towards things that are not that expensive. Like, you know, transgender bathrooms are not that expensive to um, get. 
you know, I, you know, I'm fine. I like transgender bathrooms. I like the idea of it. You know, um, I have no problem with that campaign for it. I agreed with it immediately, but it's not, it's not, you know, it wasn't something that was costly for the powers that be to, to provide to anybody, you know, it certainly didn't break the bank. And, and if you're going to do something else, like get global climate justice, well, that's going to be expensive, seriously expensive. You know, um, you're going to need a lot more than, than, um, you know, what we've been able to muster, you know, through you know, these, these conversations. Right. And it's, it's, it is kind of, I'd say an easy target is probably, it's probably true. They don't cost very much. Right. And you need like quite a lot of political organization to get, something that's truly expensive, uh, truly costly for a powerful group through. So yeah, and there's something to that. Keith, you had a question? Hi, Liam. Hey. Okay. Thank you for um, the presentation. And the question is, uh, what is moral superiority in the context of understanding highest virtue and actuality slash truth? When one says, do I actually believe I'm hearing? I'm just reading the question that I wrote because I had to write it down because there was a lot of really, really great stuff that you're talking through. So I'm going to read from the beginning of that question again. When one says, do I actually believe I'm hearing the best perspectives? Because I tend to do this too. I want to understand the perspectives I'm listening to um, so that I can come to um, a thought that is that makes sense and incorporates perspective. So when one says that, is that an example of developing egolessness versus ego or is it purely ego? Um, it seems circular and difficult. Well, I think the question is just whether one's identifying with like I, there's an I that understands things and acts differently and is kind of identifying with your actions and, and identifying yourself as superior, right? So you could, you could look at somebody and say, well, this person acts in a way that if we kind of look at moral action, we say what's desirable and undesirable, then people could be described as taking actions that are you know better or worse but but moral superiority in the sense that i mean it is kind of like placing yourself above others and and in a way that's that's ego based that you're essentially you're doing it in a way that gives you a charge that you're comparing yourself to others you know ostentatiously and getting ego satisfaction from that comparison Right, and you don't have to do that to, because you behave well. Like I very much doubt that Martin Luther King spent loads of time thinking about how morally superior he was. I think he just did things that were very, you know, morally outstanding. Totally makes sense. Much appreciate being having that like spelled out. Um, so thank you. Thank you, Keith. Um, and if anyone has any more questions, uh, keep throwing them in the chats. I have a, a, a question. Um, and one of the things I like is the this idea of code switching, kind of like grokking a certain political ideology or philosophies, like sort of language that they use and being sensitive to that because there's like words that trigger one philosophy or an ideology and won't another. Um, so do you have any kind of suggestions in order to like get in the back door, so to speak, for let's say conservative types that have this pull your, you know, your up, up your own bootstrap type thing, or to kind of uh, reference that Martin Luther King line, like it's kind of cruel to say when someone doesn't have any boots. So what kind of like language we can use in order to get into that reality tunnel and someone who has this more ideological, almost pathological version of this equality, what kind of language we can use to get into that, to have a more rich and nuanced conversation? Well, I think, you know, it's really appealing to love a lot and, and, and it's, it's a getting to embodiment, not reacting. I, I say in a lot of ways from, for me, I'm not sure I've found a lot of, I think people respect oftentimes um, wisdom traditions, especially Eastern wisdom traditions, because 
they aren't European, I think it's very useful to point out that a lot of the definitions of whiteness that are going around, right? Like this kind of like mechanized culture or hyper-rationalist culture uh, where everybody goes, you know, obeys rules, it's getting to become used as like, oh, that's whiteness. You know, I would, you know, push back against how useful that is, but well, the equality complex sounds a lot like whiteness to me, right? Like this, you know, abandonment of, of the spiritual traditions, which you can look at shamanic tribes, you can across the world, you can look at all sorts of, you know, native cultures, uh, indigenous cultures. Uh, you can look at the whole, you know, traditions of the East and, and so on. And, and that's present, you know, and, and this kind of uh, dependence on uh, moral rules is particularly Western. And so I think for leftists, um, you know, if I had more time, I'd probably go into that, that, you know, that's probably, you know, a line of rhetoric of like pointing out how particularly Western this whole, you know, viewpoint is. And, and backing that up. And there's a lot of evidence that you can use to show that psychological studies and so on. I mean, the, the Westerners are different. There's, there's a whole, you've probably heard of this weird, white, educated, industrialized, rich and democratic people, the weirdest people on earth. You know, one of the outstanding elements of that is the appeal to moral rules to justify uh, themselves. Westerners do that uh, unlike any other population. It's very unusual. And so um, it's a good way of maybe getting uh, some people from the left to question this. Um, I think for um, conservatives, it's not as much of a reactive issue in a way that kind of, it's more like than pushing for, a book, but you know, but you know, there is like, we, we still actually want global justice. We just don't want to hate you because you, you know, because you don't, you know, believe in global warming or you don't think it's a big an issue. Like I, I don't want to have a hateful um, discussion, which I think most of the time I find it's just welcome, you know, from that um, standpoint. It's not like, it doesn't mean that they're going to agree with me. They typically don't, agree. when I talk to conservative people about issues like global warming, they don't agree with me about anything, but, but, um, but they're, you know, they have an easier time discussing things with me. They easily you know, disagree with me in less anger. Cool. Um, so Andrew, you had a, a comment or question above. I don't know if you want to unmute yourself and uh, ask it or state it. <clears throat> hey y'all sure can you hear me yep hey liam thanks for the great talk man <laughs> it's been a little while um so basically this this reminds me of i guess like a long time you know quandary i've had about okay if i really care about other people and trying to decrease their suffering you know but but then I suffer as well like what is the wise thing to do um in terms of my allocation of energies and um you know if if I mean as the the famous quote of course like be the change you want to see in the world right if I heal myself if I purify myself then the world will probably appear better, but like it won't necessarily be better if I'm, you know, a monk just in the caves all the time. Mm -hmm. So um, <laughs> I guess this is a probably a hard question. I don't think necessarily Liam or anybody would have an answer or, you know, a prescription for how to behave with something like this, but like yeah, everything that you're talking about really um, brings up that that age-old quandary, I suppose. Yeah, I can. I mean, we we discuss this in life itself. So I mean, I'm happy. First of all, I believe the source that quote is Gandhi, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's worth worth remembering. I mean, Gandhi certainly didn't sit in a monastery, and so sometimes it gets quoted as uh, you know to to mean that uh, 
just be a nice person and you know other people or the world will be more nice but you know i mean gandhi obviously did a lot more than that so it wasn't wasn't it, it's hard he I, for me i think it really was don't talk don't just sit there and talk about it like you could do something but he also realized he did have a great deal of practice because he realized that like to do something well uh you know to be engaged in nonviolent activism requires nonviolence. You know, there's like what you know the thing with Thich Nhat Hanh. He came to the to uh, the U.S. and and said there was no peace in the peace movement. The reason why he was in the U.S. in the first place is because of the Vietnam War. His friends were the monks who burnt themselves in protests of the Vietnam War were were um, friends of Thich Nhat Hanh. He was kind of sent by his friends or uh, and and came to the U.S. to pursue uh, peace. Um, and so in that extraordinary circumstance, he left the monastery and did something else. It's very situational, you know? And for me, um, personally, uh, you know, we're in a very particular circumstance, right? Um, um, you know, that, that right now, when I look at the, the history of the world, like there's just a lot to do. Um, this, this is an inflection point. So um, different uh, avenues are also available. You know, like there are people who are forming communities to try to, um, you know, live a spiritual life and act this life at the same time. Like we have a group on Sundays on contemplative activism, which is full of people who, um, like Narash is here, and I see this is Charlotte, who, um, you know, have both spiritual traditions and see that as part of their activism and, and see actually advocating for contemplation's place in Western life as a, as a form of activism. Um, but I think you kind of just need to, it's centering yourself enough and looking around enough to see where you're needed and having enough solidity to, and community to be part of that. And that's the thing is don't underestimate spiritual friends uh, because that's, you know, really like, all of these, you know, purification processes are best done in a group. And there's a lot of movements to be part of right now. So I would, you know, look around and see what you can be part of. Yeah, that's a good point, man. And that, that brings um, to, to mind the word presence, right? Like those, those practices of meditation and yoga and, and certainly being a part of a group can actually increase an individual's sense of presence and um you know effectivity on the world perhaps mm. yeah absolutely. absolutely all right um so we have about five minutes left maybe i'll sneak in one last question um uh nick Tuck, uh what's that guy's name again that uh um that guy that did the equality complex he came up with the term Oh, TikTok. Yeah, yeah. And I think he came up with uh, interbeing. And that was a phrase they used, where it's like all the, all the beings kind of like recognize their dependence on one another. Um, I'm curious if you have any thoughts on that. And, uh, and from my experience, like I've, I've talked to a lot of people who are like decent people and they have like wild beliefs, but you can get along with them, you can have a beer with them, you know, they, they will treat you like a decent human being otherwise. And then other people who give lip service to like these causes, uh, but then they're kind of through like their social paths. So how do you get into interbeing towards people who, um, you know, inherently don't want the best for others? Well, I mean, it just comes down to like, um, you do like loving kindness uh, meditation. Oftentimes it's just realizing that they're doing the best that they can and a certain way and this gets into a very deep question of the, the ultimate and the relatives like so they are who they are they their past has been their past um and you can accept that you know this is a thing you, you can accept that somebody isn't a very useful part of your movement you know like i don't want to associate with them or i don't i think they're cancerous and that can just be a statement. It doesn't have to be a hatred. It can just be like, look, when this person is around, people have a lot of hurt feelings. Uh, things go awry. 
Um, there's a lot of discord. None of that has to be hateful. It can just be like, you know, like you can say people like to be strong, but you can certainly say somebody is a very high bench press. I don't have a very high bench press. My upper body's naturally not as strong. You know, it's kind of embarrassing at points. You know, I'm, it's, it's all right. You know, uh, it, it's, it's, you can say these things and they, it's, it's a question of how do you hold them? So it's it just, are you making an observation? Are you, um, you know, getting into more hatred, perpetuating the cycle? And so, you know, you have those people around and it's just kind of like, because you inter, you know, you realize that interbeing, it just means that your being is, is, is woven into theirs. It can also mean that being around them, I mean, part of interbeing is being around bad people makes you a, a difficult person. Right, like guarding the senses is a very basic concept in Buddhism, which means that like, don't expose yourself to people who are, you know, sociopaths. Right, so it doesn't doesn't mean, uh, you know, that you have to accepting people doesn't actually mean spending time around them necessarily. It just means accepting that they exist uh, and not, uh, you know, rejecting that fact. Right. So the sociopathic sniff test is a new psychotech we'll, we'll introduce that to Stoa soon, I promise. Um, so that being said, we have to close out. Uh, we're going to get kicked out soon. There's a, another event starting shortly. Um, Liam, any kind of uh, brief closing thoughts you have for us? Mm, I wish I had more something to say. Uh, you know, thanks uh, for everybody for, for, you know, as I said before, I mean, I think this is a, it's woven in deeply. Um, I just ask you to kind of keep it in mind and contemplate a little bit and see if it comes up, you know, in some part of your, of your life. I think you'll find that it's at the, at the base of, of some conversation the next week uh, there in the background. Beautiful. All right. So I'll make some closing announcements in the morning, uh, in a moment. Uh, but Liam, thank you, my friend, for coming to the STOA today. Uh, greatly appreciate it. I hope to have you back. And this will be going on YouTube uh, shortly. I'll probably post it later today. Uh, upcoming events at uh, in a, uh, 15 minutes, uh, Joe Edelman and the Human Systems team has their social design club here at the STOA um, every Wednesday at 1.30 p.m. Eastern time. And this today is interesting. They're going to look at dating uh, and then look at kind of the social norms and social systems behind that and how we can uh, redesign it uh, to have better dates because, um, you know, everyone needs love in their life. And uh, tomorrow at 12 p.m. Eastern time, uh, Susan Blackmore, uh, a scholar of memetics, is coming in uh, with a talk, Conscious of Selfish Genes and Meme Machines, which should be fun. Um, check out more events at thestoa.ca, and you can support us on Patreon. Uh, that being said, Liam, everyone, thank you for coming to the STOA today. Thanks for having me.